Greetings, everyone! Uh, it's my favorite day of the week. We get to talk with a person doing awesome stuff with hardware. Today's guest is Amitabh Srivastava, who is a physicist turned engineer. And uh, hello, Amitabh. How's it going? Hey, Alex. How are you doing? I'm awesome. I love the stuff that you build, and I'm really excited to get to spend an hour talking about it. Okay. Yeah. So first off, could you tell us a little bit about your physicist turned engineer tag? Yeah, so I, I mean, you know, growing up, I was this child prodigy, prodigy person, like, you know, nationally ranked in various science Olympiads and stuff. And I really wanted to pursue astrophysics. Uh, and that's what I was studying for at Indian Institute of Science in India. And then I did an internship at Brandeis University on radio astronomy. And uh, I was studying these orientation indicators for quasars super fun stuff like on paper, but it turned out that it was mostly data crunching. <laughs> and um, that's when I kind of pivoted. And uh, I've loved making stuff since like, you know, ever since I can remember. So I went instead into being like an engineering consultant for the ecology department where I made things like um, underwater gates for fishes or robotic systems to study like lizard mating behavior drones and uh, a 13 foot tall circuit board that measures elephant height in the wild <laughs> um you know that kind of started this journey of just you know going to different startups and managing hardware departments and just making stuff and like you know learning how to learn because i don't have like formal training in uh, engineering as such but uh yeah it, 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 that's honestly why i love the open source hardware community so much it's because people are so free with sharing information and helping out and educating each other. And that's why I'm super happy to be here at uh, Hackster Cafe as well. Did you say a 13 foot tall circuit board? Uh-huh. What? Yeah. <laughs> was it all one piece? No, it was not. I pushed the manufacturers like to their limit and they were like, the max we can do is like one meter. And then they ended up doing like 1.1 meter, like specifically for me. Uh, but um, yeah, I kind of like strung three or four of them, I think, together. And uh, I also soldered all of them myself. So there was like hundreds of through hole LEDs. It was essentially like a light curtain. So you have oh. LEDs on one side and detectors on the other side. And you're just, the elephant casts a shadow. And that's what you're measuring. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so I, I soldered. It took like a dozen movies or something like that, where I was just like, boop. <gasps> Soldering, soldering, soldering. <laughs> What's your favorite type of movie for while you're putting together hardware? Ooh, that's a good question. I think it just so varies. I often mm -hmm. use like cinema as a way to understand uh, like different cultures and humans in general. So, you know, I watch anything from like rom-coms to sci-fi. I don't know. <laughs> <if that. laughs> Solid. Well, okay. So if people can find you. First up, we're going to put all these links in the description below. But uh, to start off, we've got your link tree with your most recent maker portfolio, which is full of really cool stuff that I haven't necessarily didn't know you did all of this stuff beforehand. Yeah. You've got an incredibly broad. Uh, and <laughs> let's just have a look at that for a minute. Yeah. So what's going on in this tiny couch situation? I remember seeing yeah. this on Instagram and it was so <laughs> delightful to me. Yeah, it's just, a, you know, a little bit of, uh, you know, a little bit of quirky pleasure my partner Malini and I were just walking down Manhattan and you know as one does we happened across this tiny couch right outside of this um, like elementary school or kindergarten something like they were just throwing it out and it was perfectly fine so we just picked it up and uh, now it's actually right there in the living room and it's a couch for our cat Kiri. Uh, I've worked on a lot of uh, cat projects most of which Kiri doesn't use <laughs> them. like she's been on that couch like all of twice <laughs> but um i uh i i mounted this using french cleats and um if um i don't know most people would know about them but if you don't it's an absolutely amazing system for attaching things to a wall it is basically too well okay so this is your wall right and then you attach a piece of wood that has this kind of a cut. And then you can attach another piece of wood just by putting it on top of it. And now this 45 degree angle keeps things from like falling down, but also mm -hmm. forward, right? 
and then you can just lift it up and take it out and move things around. Um, but I, I was like sitting on it just to kind of show to my partner that it is incredibly sturdy and Curie will not be hurt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, you've even got some more Spider-Man photos on your Instagram. Uh, so it's yeah. definitely capable of carrying a couch, if nothing else. <laughs> Tell us about this 100 days of sharing hashtag that you're using here. Yeah, uh, so this is a thing that I did um, a few months back. It ended on May the 4th, actually. Yeah, I, I guess uh, I quit my job about a year and a half, a year back. And, uh, you know, since then, I've been kind of like working in this makerspace at home. And uh, as you can imagine, it's, you know, sometimes very difficult to keep yourself motivated and accountable to work on projects every day because, you know, you can always find excuses for not making progress. And uh, I just wanted to challenge myself and prove to myself that I could actually deliver on a timeline. And also I'd never done like video editing before. So it just seemed like an interesting oh, wow. thing to do where every day I was building something new and recording myself and editing into a quick video that I would then share on like Instagram and YouTube. And that was incredibly fun. And, um, yeah, I would highly recommend it to uh, anybody who has a free time on their hands. It was, yeah, I ended up learning a lot very quickly. What would you say the balance of different projects that you made was? Uh, was it mostly electronics, mostly hardware? Yeah, so it was actually, I've been uh, like, uh, so I, I've i done a lot of like electronics in my job, like manufacturing electronics and sourcing components and working with like uh, suppliers in China, all of that stuff. So I have been concentrating over the last year to do more mechanical things, more 3D printing, metalworking, woodworking, because it's just more fun and you see results so much more quickly. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, for example, it's just, uh, it's a lithophane and- uh, <laughs> Classic. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, so, so I mostly did, uh, I think, simple mechanical things um, and yeah, and sometimes it's the simplest things that you don't end up doing because you're like, yeah, it'll, it'll work, you know, and there's no, no challenge there, but then the execution is where like, you know, the devil lies in the details. So sometimes you just have to be like, okay, if you think it'll work, just do it. Okay. What was one of those projects where you thought it would be simple, but then it snuck up on you kind of? Oh man, you know, metal casting looks Ooh. so much simpler than it is. Oh my God. Yeah. I think that was that was a big one uh, where I was like, oh, wait a minute. So I have this little uh, foundry that's um, um, that's propane torch and you know insulation on the sides. And the concept is pretty simple, right? You take this graphite crucible, you put some metal in there. I was using Zamac 12. I forget the name of the YouTuber, uh, but this great guy, he kind of pointed me to this thing, which uh, it's kind of like pewter, but it's zinc based. So it's not, uh, you know, uh, as toxic and uh, it melts really well, flows really well. So it's this, um, anyway, so you, you put some uh, Zamac 12 alloy into this crucible, you put it inside the kiln and it heats up and melts. And then you take off the surface from the top and you make this mold out of, um, I used uh, Polymaker um, uh, kind of wax, uh, wax uh, filament, mm. which 3D print, and then you have this, you know, positive of your object, you cast it in plaster of Paris, right? And uh, then you put this thing inside the kiln as well, and all of the wax just melts and burns away. And this filament is good because it burns away without leaving any residue. So you're left with this mold in plaster of Paris, and then you can just pour your metal in there. And, uh, you know, because plaster of Paris, that's the one, thank you. Uh, mm. Uh, because Plaster of Paris is a good insulator, um, your metal will cool slowly and it'll take some while. But, you know, once it's solidified, uh, you just, you know, strike it and like get rid of the Plaster of Paris and you're left with the positive of your um, of your uh, 3D printed thing in metal. And yeah, you can use it to make like jewelry and stuff like that. I made a door knocker for my sister who recently bought a house and uh, yeah, yeah, so you need this fancy, like, you know, it's actually, that's a fun project too. But uh, <laughs> in the shape of 
uh, uh, her engagement uh, rings, which I designed as well <laughs> and got well, made silver. That was good. But uh, yeah. Yeah, it, it, you end up with like so many problems with like just flowing of the metal and you have to develop this intuitive understanding for like where you need like more air holes and things like that. Um, and, you know, from a like, you know, especially coming from like a physics standpoint, it's kind of like, yeah, whatever. Like, you know, it seems pretty simple that you should be able to see this thing and be like, okay, there is where you'll need. No, it's, it's not simple. It's super complicated fluid dynamics problem that you're not going to be able to solve in your head without doing a bunch of experimentation. No, oh, no. <laughs> well, check out, uh, speaking of fluid dynamics, uh, <laughs> I noticed that you've left this one off of your uh, <laughs> official slideshow, but I love it. Uh, could you tell us <laughs> about this one? Okay, so this one is... Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's a hula hoop cat carrier, and you can see Curie in the side there. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I've got a little LED ring with an LED kind of uh, moving around. I was hoping that Curie will chase the LED, but right now she's just a little bit too scared. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's, I, I was like, why not? Like, you know, do this thing where you can carry your cat around and she has a full 360 degree view and she gets to move around. She is not like, you know, pinned down into a small space. Um, yeah, I made it out of uh, uh, polycarbonate and I used like um, techniques from uh, sheet metal working because polycarbonate is basically aluminum, you know? Ah. Um, and uh, yeah, it, so I made this, uh, I made this, line heater to bend all of those tabs and riveted them together and stuff and it was a very riveting <laughs> riveting experience um yeah it seems a lot more dynamic and active than your standard cat backpack and it's a lot more fun to watch as well but yeah i did make a standard cat backpack too out of oh. the leftover pieces of polycarbonate and it's just like fully clear um i like uh i like things that are like fully clear yeah okay so um let's talk about some of your more intense projects you've got a cool uh view here of your workshop which yes. i'm getting a peek at it here behind you and it looks amazing yes. so this but is then... office space slash the clean room space where it's more electronics and ah. everything. and then downstairs is the basement which is the full I've got woodworking, I've got wow. uh, basic metalworking, I've got welding, I've got a laser cutter, 40 watt CO2, I've got a few CNCs, I've got a shaper origin, which is fun, and um, metal casting, uh, vacuum casting, um, vacuum forming, and uh, yeah, other mix and max. This brings us to one of my favorite things that you've done, programmable air. Was this the first company that you founded? Um, yeah, I mean, I honestly, I wouldn't call it a company. It sounds well, more. Yeah, what is, is it the first like product that you released as a? Yes, uh, that's yeah. true. I uh, so it's programmable air is an open source hardware controller for uh, pneumatic soft robots, and um, I've got one here somewhere. I just picked it up. Oh, there it is. And uh, so what it is is. There's a couple air pumps that um, have both vacuum and high pressure. So they suck in air from one side and then push air out of the other side. Um, and then they've got three valves. They're just solenoid valves that open and close an air circuit. So if it's turned on, it'll allow air to flow like this. And if it's closed, it'll just block, right? Um, it's got a pressure sensor underneath uh, over here and an Arduino Nano that uh, controls everything. And you can add more valve boards on either side to control more soft robots. But essentially, you've got this tube. And by turning the pumps and the valves on and off, you can push air in, pull air out, or let the robot exchange air with the atmosphere, all, all while kind of like reading the pressure as feedback for the state of your robot. And uh, I wrote an Arduino library for it, which makes it like you know super easy to a blow, suck, or vent, and kind of the tagline is programmable air. It sucks as well as it blows. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually and true because these pumps generate like half of 
an atmosphere of pressure plus and minus. So it sucks as well as it blows, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and back in 2019, uh, we yes. actually did our, I think it might have been the first time that we met maybe, uh, but yeah. this was at, was this Crowd Supply Teardown or was it Hackaday yes, it Supercon? Was 2019 Teardown. Wow. And I remember seeing this for the first time and just being like, what? <laughs> and then you sent me one to use and I uh, tried it out for uh, a tutorial and it was really nice. easy to use. I was yeah. just like, one could say blown away with how <laughs> oh, oh dear. Uh, with how easy it was to use. And I wanted to make a little sort of meditation breathing guide with it. Uh, I think it ended up being a little noisy for that. But that's sort of something that comes with the territory. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm actually, um, they, are, they keep getting sold out. And I'm supposed to be manufacturing more of them for Mauser. But uh, I'm being lazy about that. So sorry <laughs> if you've ordered it or if you're waiting on your order <laughs> if you really need it for something cool honestly people drive up to my house and pick up uh, a, a unit like fairly regularly <laughs> 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 so i'm always happy to support people who want to use it for something fun um but i'm actually working on uh it i'm kind of bifurcating it into two things i'm making a lower cost version for like high schoolers and like just and it'll be slightly reduced um, kind of uh, features, but uh, much more affordable. And then I'm making one for artists and academics uh, who want to make stuff that is really going to last. Um, and um, yeah, so that'll be like using industrial grade components and it'll be more extensible and stuff. Uh, yeah. But Ooh. honestly, yeah, this is perfect that you're scrolling through this because the best part of programmable layer for me has been just collaborating with people on all of these fun projects. And uh, it, I, I love being like the engineering guy who helps someone uh, get their creative projects to life. And yeah. uh, this is fun. <laughs> it's so satisfying to watch. <laughs> I'm going to watch this one going as well. Yes, that is so cool. Yeah. It looks so naturalistic. So Julia is like, she's like an incredibly talented artist. And you might have seen some of her work in like TVs and stuff, making prosthetics and uh, things like zombie face masks and stuff like that. Yeah. Cool. So we can find more of the stuff that you've been working on through your link tree here. You've also got your Instagram, your personal website. I want to go through these really quick just to show people what you've got uh, around on the internet. You have a YouTube channel. Yeah. With... Uh, Mostly so many... the sharing, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then, of course, there's tinkermind.me, which is sort of the official site. We've got, uh, and there's a lot of interesting stuff on here that I want to dig into as well. Uh, we might not have enough time. We've got a uh, Twitter <laughs> slash X account, uh, Instagram, GitHub, all kinds of cool stuff on here for people to dig into. Programmableair.com, and then also refrigeradiro.org, which is another project that we maybe should talk about for a moment. Yeah. Refrigeradiro. <laughs> um, so Refrigeradiro started uh, with. Uh, um, it's just noticing that the refrigeration industry is like, it seems to be caught like a few decades behind. Um, like, you know, there it seems like, you know, for most buildings, their HVAC and refrigeration systems are not really that different now than they were in the 70s. And I think that like, you know, we, we deserve better than an iPad slap to a fridge door and call that innovation, you know. What I want to see is I want to see like a beautiful, transparent um, fruit and veggie crisper that sits on your countertop on uh, in the kitchen so that like, you know, it's inviting you to snack on fruits and veggies. Right. And that actually makes a lot of sense because fruits and veggies require a completely different refrigeration system. Like veggies want to be like mostly moist and uh, like, you know, just chill. And fruits, you want to um, uh, actually circulate as much air as possible to get rid of the ethylene gas that uh, makes them ripen too soon and then, like, you know, kind of like, over ripen. And uh, also, you want to remove moisture to just kind of like prevent any bacterial growth and stuff. Um, so, it, those sliders that you have in the very bottom drawer of your uh, fruit and veggie things, they're actually there for a reason because, you know, if you switch it to fruits, it circulates more air 
but we don't really use them that well and ah. like you know hidden underneath all of the stuff like you know all of the snacks in the fridge that's not the best place to put fruits and veggies they need they need a leg up <laughs> um and in general like you know kind of like refrigerated furniture for example right i have this leather couch that's absolutely horrible to sit on because there's no circulation between you and the leather and you know that just promotes like sweating and stuff why mm. not you know some high end cars have cool seats um and uh, so you've got airflow between you and the seat and i think that that would be great to have in an office chair you know why not have uh, air circulation and you can buy some of these things but they're not mainstream enough uh and certainly not refrigerated uh seats you know a mattress why not have air circulation through your mattress um so that you can have like a big blanket on top of you and that will actually make your um uh your sleep uh, experience better because like you know it'll be insulate you from uh you can switch off the ac in your house and then your mattress can cool you down and uh the blanket actually is insulation so it protects the uh heat from the outside uh, to come in and um you know you can reduce your air conditioning bill a lot by turning off ac at night for example um and this is yeah why heat all that extra space <laughs> yeah exactly right like you're spending most of your time sitting on your office chair or on your mattress in the house right mm. so why cool anything else same for winter like you know in uh, in warehouses or like a workshop environment for example why heat the space when you can heat the person right have these directed infrared spotlights that are just tracking Ooh. you and i made like a spotlight uh, that tracks <gasps> your face just for that to kind of show that it's really not that difficult to make something that you, if you have four of these in corners of your workshop it'll be like you're standing next to a fireplace all the time slap a little thermal camera on top of it and um, actually register the skin temperature and make sure that your skin is at the right temperature by regulating the amount of infrared light that's coming from different directions and you could be in a freezing workshop and feel like you're toasty um you know why why heat the space that's not actually does not need to be heated and to kind of start these conversations about bigger things with refrigeration and hvac and you know kind of there's the whole sustainability and climate impact angle mm -hmm. i wanted to just make something that's a conversation starter and that's this uh, backpack refrigerator <laughs> so <laughs> This is something that my friend Aaron and I put together over a weekend literally for um uh for a new lab open house which is new lab is this uh, hardware incubator thing in uh, Brooklyn and what it is is a full vapor compression based refrigerator we've got a compressor over here this is a fancy compressor it's actually developed by DARPA for making cooling suits for soldiers in the gulf but now oh. it's available for uh public use and it's it's a bldc compressor uh it uses something similar to a drone motor inside instead of an ac motor and that's why it's so much smaller and obviously it's made more precise so it vibrates less and stuff like that but um so um you've got the compressor radiator and then um uh, your compressor compresses your refrigerant gas that heats it up so the radiator cools it down and then it comes down this tube and through this thin tube and when it goes through this thin, thin tube it co goes from like a high pressure environment to a low pressure environment and if you've noticed like um a freeze uh, a compressed air can when you let the air out it uh, expands and cools down same thing happens here here so as soon as this uh, uh compressed refrigerant expands it cools down and like you know right away you'd see like snow forming here because it cools down very rapidly and then here you have a heat exchanger that's um exchanging heat between your liquor so this entire thing cools a single bottle of liquor <laughs> uh, and you're pulling in the liquor through this tube over here it um you know cools down by being next to the cold refrigerant and then you pump it back out and then you know you can just walk around a party serving chill shots and you can you know just pour a shot like regular 
which was an incredibly popular vi- i think this is the most popular video on our instagram so far this is from supercon last yeah. year when i first saw this and you were walking around with a bottle of fireball and just like dispensing shots with little tiny plastic shot glasses that you had brought and it was incredible <laughs> um, you also gave a talk about it uh, at open hardware summit this year yes. and gave this amazing sort of you were just walking th- us through a few minutes ago of this this sort of different use cases for it but um you told this whole story from sort of start to finish about how uh, someone would use directed refrigeration and cooling in everyday life. And we also had this cool experiment with uh, cooled LEDs that actually yeah. go faster. So, you know, in, when you're talking about the uh, cooled office chair and stuff, it, of course, makes me think of, you know, of course, that would make your, your computer go faster, too. My computer yeah. would be a lot happier if we were both cooled. <laughs> so true uh, and like you know i can totally imagine like it, what if you had so refrigeration is this one thing where bigger is better um you know it, and actually a lot of refrigeration started out being the centralized thing in chicago if you do the uh boat tour of the city and go through some of the historic buildings you'll run across this one building that's essentially a giant refrigerator chiller that supplied cold water to uh, like a do- dozens of uh, office buildings around it. And back then, like buildings didn't have centralized uh, cooling or anything like that. So, you know, you would just be piping cold water through radiators in the building and cooling the whole building. And we can bring that back, you know, and it would be so much more uh, efficient, I think, if you have this centralized chiller system in your house. And like plumbing, you're just plumbing, you know, coolant through your house and you can plug in your laptop or your PS5 or PS6, I guess, not only for power, mm-hmm. but also for cooling. So you don't have these noisy fans that are trying to like heat up the air around you as your AC is trying to cool it. Uh, instead, your CPU is being cooled directly by this giant chiller in, in your house, right? You plug in your e-scooter or bike or car even, and your house cools the battery as it is charging which increases the battery life and uh, makes the charging go a lot faster as well. Um, I can imagine running like server grade uh, GPUs and CPUs on a laptop because you can actually cool the thing fast enough. Most of a a GPU volume is actually the heat sink and the fans and stuff, right? Uh, The silicon itself is pretty small. Uh, If you can just run coolant through and uh, cool it fast enough, you can uh, do incredible things. You can make power tools that are like so much smaller, uh, you know, things like orbital sanders that are the size of your palm, right? Wow. That you can actually, um, uh, and, and they would go a lot faster, generate a lot less dust because uh, you won't have to have this airflow cooling the motor, right? Um, and yeah, just, yeah, there's a lot of possibility in uh, like a shower head that if you live in like California or, uh, you know, Texas, a hot state, you can't take a cold shower in the summer because the central like main supply is hot water. Um, so what about a shower head that just cools the water as it is, you know, coming out and through and, you know, you can utilize uh, 3d printing to metal 3d printing to make these incredible heats, um, heat exchangers that are incredibly efficient. Like you can sink like 2000 Watts of uh, heat in the space of a shower head pretty easily. Um, yeah, so I think about this stuff a lot, and uh, Refugee Diary is kind of an attempt to start some of these conversations. Yeah. Now, uh, you did uh, some work with Building Link, which was IoT automating skyscrapers. You did some stuff with uh, asset tags embedded in buildings. It feels like you've sort of, your career has almost been leading to this in terms of thinking at like a building scale or even larger. Is this just a way that you think now? Um. Yeah, so I, hmm, let's see. That's a good, I think there's a, uh, there has been a shift that's been happening in my thinking where um, I used to love like, you know, doing quick uh, projects and like, you know, 100 days of sharing kind of things, uh, which are great. But I think that like um, a lot of, uh, a lot of the maker community um, kind of creativity is underutilized in industrial scale, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that uh, 
Yeah, that's why I think a lot more companies need to hire a lot more creative technologists to think about everyday mundane things and see how, like, you know, you can think of them in a cyberpunk future, you know, uh, because somebody has to build that future, right? We all want to see ourselves in, like, minority report kind of a world, but... I mean, maybe not minority report, but, like, there's definitely stuff where, like, the... The display from that, I remember, you know, for years after Minority Report, the movie came out, everybody was make, want, trying to make these gloves that could do the display thing. And it's like, oh, yeah, it'd be so cool. I'm but, bouncing over here. Absolutely. It's... But the problem with that is that you know, the the open source hardware makers weren't actually there to be like, you know what, guys, this is incredibly tiring to actually have your hands up <laughs> like this. Let's just put them down on a surface, maybe. <laughs> maybe it's good for you. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Well, be. Maybe RSI. Anyway, that's that's super red. And, you know, what you were saying about 3D printing these things, people might think that that's not something that necessarily makes sense. But we've got Relativity Space who are doing 3D printing metal rocket engines, which are massive. And uh, this is clearly something that, like, you know... Oh, there are several companies pursuing uh, metal 3D printing specifically for heat exchange. Um as you know, devices get smaller and smaller, you need, I mean, so heat exchange is a completely surface phenomenon. I love this radiator because it's almost like a fractal radiator. Uh, these small things that you see here are fins, but the fins themselves have smaller fins. So it's all about generating more and more surface area. And 3D printing is great for uh, generating those sort of intricate structures inside of a closed shell because you do need an enclosed shell for two fluids to kind of like, you know, interface with either, each other without mixing, right? Um, and it, yeah, I, I completely think that for, for, I mean, this is not me, like, that's where the industry is moving. Like, you know, heat exchangers are going to be 3D printed. <laughs> There's, I, yeah, I don't see a way around it. Makes total sense. Are there other uh, innovations in materials, in processes that are exciting you for the future besides this sort of amazing like fractal metal 3D printing for, for heat exchange? Um, it's, I think that there's so much unrealized potential in the industrial um, ecosystem that exists already. For example, I think that circuit boards are highly underutilized. Um, in uh, uh, in in everyday life, I think sometimes it's cheaper to get a circuit board, um, uh, custom circuit board manufactured, than to get like just regular printing done on a high quality paper. That's uh, true. <laughs> so I'm like, I, I'm actually designing this curriculum of, uh, and I've taught a few classes on PCB design for artists. Like PCBs, uh, printed circuit boards don't have to have anything to do with electronics. What it is, is a fiberglass resin board with two copper layers and uh, four layers of uh, silk screen, right? So you're printing a lot of these things. And then like, you know, when you look through it, through the light, uh, copper blocks a lot of the light and different colors of silk screen block light differently. You can get them gold plated. You, if you make something mm -hmm. and people like it, you know, drop shipping to a million people is like, that right because they can be manufactured the whole ecosystem of logistics exists for for getting these things in the hands of people very quickly so I, i'm doing a lot of things on tindy and um, etsy of like coasters and stuff like that made of pcbs and they're incredibly high quality and like you know then you can do like niche and bespoke stuff that can be made in like essentially one-off quantities for a very reasonable price but i still haven't seen like a pcb wedding card or Christmas cards or like, you know, some things with like simple LEDs and stuff or NFC tag that have the wedding website and all that's possible. And I, I'm, it's, it's coming. I'm sure that someone will do it soon enough, but you know, I think sooner is better and more is better. Yeah. yeah we've <laughs> so, got this, for example, what you were saying about poster sized things, you know, this beautiful. type of product from Simone Yich just being beautiful and you've got the gold on there and, just, ah, it looks so, so professional. It looks so good. Yeah. Um, yeah. So speaking of, let's see, speaking of teaching, you mentioned you're, you've taught a, a class a few times on PCB design for artists. Uh, you yourself went through, uh, 
is it the uh, the NY and NYU Masters in Creative Technology? Tell us yes. about that. What kinds of things did you study, and uh, what did you get out of it? So I went to ITP, which is an Interactive Telecommunications Program. Sounds super weird because it was made in like the sixties. Uh, when, uh, you know, telecommunication was a thing, like, you know, oh, will televisions take off? Uh, you know, what will happen to film and theater? <laughs> and, um, but what it is, is it, the tagline is Center for Recently Possible. So it is a master's program that puts together engineers and artists to just kind of like, you know, come together and play and make things. And it was an incredible experience. Um, it, um, you know, kind of taught me a lot about because it's an in, in, incredibly internationally diverse program as well. So people from all uh, all parts of the world and all ages and uh, different skill sets. And like, you know, they just come together to make incredible things. Um, one of the fun things that I did was uh, Caricatron, uh, which is <laughs> this uh, robotic caricature uh, artist that uh, looks at you and like kind of like makes a very... Um, like, you know, it does an open CV kind of detection of your features. And then this AxiDraw uh, pen plotter with a large pantograph uh, draws your face <laughs> on a touch screen. <laughs> so it was just like, it, it's like this really silly, fun thing that I think that I could have only done at ITP. And, you know, I actually got like window space to showcase it, <laughs> which was incredibly fun. <laughs> So you're taking jobs from real people. What, how do you feel about that whole debate in terms of like machines and uh, human artists and how they can play together? I mean, you know, I, I think that it might be a little bit... Okay, I think the people who can best utilize generative technologies are people with taste and um, aesthetic. And most people don't have that. And I think that being an artist and actually going through the process of uh, uh, like, you know, doing this thing yourself. So that uh, is a great way to develop that design aesthetic. So I think that generated AI for better or for worse is here to stay, right? Um, so I think that what would be good is if the artistic community would embrace it and like kind of get ahead of it almost uh, at, because um, it's there kind of to make their jobs easier. Um, and I think that it is possible to leverage that technology to really like 10x the output of artists. And then they can actually take on like, you know, commissions from individuals rather than uh, companies or stuff to do, uh, to, like, you know, I, it would be great to have a store where you get, uh, to work with an artist to design like, you know, a few t-shirts for yourself, right? Um, and I think that there would be demand for that, uh, like when it, where you just actually have a conversation with an individual and be like, oh, this is the stuff that I like. And then the artist is kind of like um, uh, kind of prompting the AI stuff to uh, generate uh, uh, things. And it, live, you're having this interaction where like, you're like, oh, I like this, I like that. and And then like, you know, for example, this T-shirt I made like at my home using a vinyl, you know, thermal uh, 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 vinyl cutter with thermal ink and then iron it on, right? And mm -hmm. I would much rather wear this shirt than uh, like you know something from you know some other brand or something like that. Uh, but I would even better than this would be like you know something that combines my love for you know science fiction and Indian uh, heritage. So like, you know, Indian cyberpunk, right? Mm. I, I'm not, I've tried and I'm not good at actually, you know, prompting mid journey to make some of that stuff. And I think that what would be good is an artist who has actually, you know, thought about these things uh, and thought about like surrealism and like, you know, combining different disciplines and things and then they would be able to do a much better job of making things. And then, you know, I would get to wear these things and I could, you know, truly say that this is something that's designed for me. And uh, yeah, so I, th I think that it's kind of like, you know, s similar to like industrial revolution or even when like, you know, iron became a thing, you know, all the 
brass and bronze and copper people were like oh this is taking jobs away but like you know with uh, but those were the people who ended up then making all of the iron tools that have survived through the ages uh, and you know we are finding now because the copper rusted away so um yeah i think that uh, it'll be fine <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely a touchy topic and i do think that there's you know valid points there in terms of like there are like real people losing real jobs and and companies that sort of want to cut them out but i think that uh if i may interject a little bit of my own opinion i do think that there's going to be yeah. people are going to tire of the sort of hype and the things that look very ai generated and it will likely be sort of an aesthetic uh that like you say you know it, it takes someone with sort of an eye we still have designers even though we have like canva and and tools like that that make it easy uh in order to make something that that really looks good and for example with your indian cyberpunk uh generation which i think sounds amazing you know one of the issues with ai is that uh it draws from a biased set of materials and for example looking for you know uh something particular about a certain culture that is not well integrated into the western canon it's mm. going to be more likely that you'll come out with something that looks like a caricature that looks like stereotypes of stuff from that culture which is just like not the same thing and so having the eye for someone who comes from whatever culture you're trying to work with you know it still seems incredibly relevant to me personally yeah no and honestly i'm kind of really looking forward to the reading the comments on this and people can <laughs> how incredibly wrong i am in all the ways because i'm definitely like you know a technophile i i love technology and i see solutions only in technology but obviously as you said you know the impact is real and there are real people whose real livelihood and like you know decades of work is at stake so you know i think their voices sh uh, should be heard and um yeah i'm looking forward to being educated in the comment section <laughs> that's a very positive approach um I think that's the kind of uh, mindset that we need going forward. Let's see. So uh, on to a, a slightly less contentious topic. Uh, for programmable air, you took it through crowd supply. Yes. And with Refrigeridiro, you've brought it to Discord. For now, people can go join the Discord and make cooler refrigeration systems together. You're really big on the puns, huh? <laughs> I love it. Uh, and so having gone through both of those different processes, what was your experience with doing crowdfunding through crowd supply and how do you think that will inform how you choose to approach refrigeridiro and other projects in the future sure um so i did consider kickstarter for example as well but crowd supply is just like you know by makers for makers and they're very open on the open source like the entire project management is on github actually so you just open issues and uh, like, you know, they're, the team is super responsive and absolutely love like Josh and uh, like the whole team at Crowd Supply for sure. Um, it is an incredible amount of work. Um, the team is in incredibly supportive throughout the journey. And I think that if you're an individual creator and you think that you have something that you want to bring to the world, then I could not recommend Crowd Supply highly enough. But also it's... It's a ton of work. Um, uh, so, you know, it, it, a lot of times I, I kind of like people are like, um, uh, they come to me and being like, oh, yeah, man, this thing, let's just crowd supply it, right? Or like, let's just crowdfund it. And I'm like, yeah, that you're talking about something that will take like three months of like, you know, at least a part time job amount of <laughs> work. I think that they've cultivated a really good community of like-minded people. I always have a look at the crowd supply, uh, their weekly newsletter, the email, because it's, uh, yeah, it's always like, you know, uh, some fun things and it's a good way to uh, keep a pulse on what's happening in the open source world because what's available and what's possible are so incredibly different things often. And I think that like, you know, uh, crowd supply is a good way of kind of like bridging those two things because uh, uh, if it's possible, then what's keeping it from being like, you know, something that you can just purchase. Uh, and it's a good platform to try that stuff out. For refrigeration in particular, I think that it's, um, I have a story uh, for programmable air actually. Uh, oh, yeah. When I was initially selling like, you know, these hand, uh, uh, hand soldered units, uh, this professor, I forget from which university reached out to me and was like, um, I need this to be portable and battery operated. 
So can you make uh, me a battery pack for this? And uh, it so turned out that I was, I was having the same issue and I had made a little battery add-on that connected through pogo pins and supplied power. Um, and it uses lithium ion batteries, right? Um, and I was like, yeah, sure. You know, I can just uh, uh, give one of those things to you. So he actually paid me and I could not sleep that night because I just had like, you know, this visions of uh, the lithium ion battery like exploding or overcharging or something going wrong. And uh, ended up returning the money and being like, I don't feel comfortable, like, you know, selling this thing to you. Um, and I did find like, you know, a, a battery bank that just had 12 volt output. And, you know, instead he ended up using that. But refrigeration is, you know, I'm a universally certified HVAC technician now. So there's a lot of things that you need to do to do refrigeration safely. You're dealing with compressed gas and... Uh, uh, in this case, for example, the refrigerant is propane. Uh, so oh, wow. you know, something goes wrong and, you know, you have this whole lithium ion battery pack and you've got propane compressed uh, and things can go very wrong very quickly. Um, so I, I'm kind of on a similar boat now where I don't think that I, feel, I would feel comfortable selling any of the refrigeration things that I make. And also in terms of like open sourcing a lot of these designs, I'm very wary because um, I don't want someone to kind of approach this from, you know, a, a place of a little bit of naivete um, and injure themselves, right? So, um, right. yeah, I think, yeah. But, but it, that's where I think community building comes in a lot because I think that a lot of, for example, retired HVAC technicians and stuff are, you know, willing and wanting to make uh, contributions and like, you know, help people to do these things in the right manner. Um, so yeah, hopefully uh, I, I'm just going to let things evolve organically. Um, and hopefully it'll turn out that like, you know, people, uh, uh want the same things that, you know, I, I, I want to be like a tool that people use to get the things that they want. Right. Instead of, uh, kind of pushing something. Absolutely. Yeah sort of enabling people to to build yeah. the refrigeration systems they want to see in the world. Yeah. So, like, you know, things like uh, this athlete uh, reached out and it's, like, injured. Um, and, you know, is, is, he's supposed to take ice baths. And he's like, can um, I convert my bathtub into an ice plunge? Right? And I'm like, okay, that is interesting. So let's think about, like, how, how we can uh, process this. And you know, maybe it turns out that the easiest thing to do is to just kind of like dump a bunch of ice into the bathtub, right? And not actually use refrigeration at all. And if that's the best solution, then like, you know, I think that, you know, keep the technology aside. Uh, but yeah, let's, I think it'll be nice to have those conversations. Mm. I, I would love to revisit something that we talked about a moment ago. Speaking again about your uh, creative technology masters, in the context of a world where there's generative AI and stuff, um, and also of what you got out of the program in the first place, uh -huh. would you recommend uh, that someone go through a program like this? Because there's a lot of autodidacts in our community, a lot of people who are self-taught, uh, yeah. and a lot of information on the on the internet. But yeah, yeah, huh. that's a that's a tough question. I think that you're getting different things out of uh, a program like ITP. I don't think that the key thing that you're getting out is, well, if you're an artist and you're like, you know, kind of looking to learn technology, then certainly, you know, try out places like um, Hackster, for example, is a great, great platform to uh, learn about uh, engineering things and skill up. I think that doing projects to learn a skill is something that has helped me the most, right? Um, what ITP provides is structure. Um, and I, I think the whole thing with college, right? is this societal template that we have become kind of acquainted with. And like, there is certain like societal um, respect in being a student. Um, and, you know, for better or for worse, uh, being a student in your home is relatively looked down upon versus being a student in an accredited 
institution, right? Um, so a lot of what you get out of the program is like the community and uh, structure, right? Mm. And if you're self-motivated and disciplined enough to actually um, spend your time productively, like I pushed myself harder at ITP than I, uh, than I did even, I think, at 100 Days of Sharing, you know? So just being surrounded by this energy of other people who are there to like, you know, learn new things and like, you know, uh, this kind of sense of very tight knit community. The ITP community is like so tight knit. Like, you know, I can reach out to any ITP alum. Uh, and like, uh, actually 2019 teardown when we met, I just shot out an email to the alumni group being like, hey guys, I'm in Portland and like, you know, uh, would like to learn more about like what the hardware scene is here. And like, you know, that day I ended up meeting of an ITP alum for coffee, right? Um, nice. So <laughs> yeah, that's that's kind of what you get out of uh, programs, right? Uh, and if you're doing that at by yourself and, you know, you can have lots of learning, but it's just unfortunately like, you know, makerspace is a few and far between and uh, um, uh, it's difficult to keep self-motivated. So, you know, I, I think that it's a great, great thing to go through if you can like, you know, afford it. Um, I don't think it's a waste of money, but uh, you can learn the same things uh, by doing things yourself for sure. I think that a lot of the ITP courses are online as well. A lot of the professors, like for example, the Coding Train is this YouTube channel by Dan Schiffman, who's a professor at ITP. And uh, there's really no need to take Dan's classes. Uh, his YouTube channel has more information than any class could contain. Um, so, you know, what you're getting out of it is like being surrounded by other people who are also, you know, kind of on the same train <laughs> and uh, doing the same things. And, you know, you can all do things together. It's true that uh, I and some other people that I know who didn't go through a traditional engineering uh, educational system, for example, are thinking about now, like, maybe I'd like to do that just so I can get grounded in the fundamentals. And like you said, have like a sort of structure to learn within a mm -hmm. very guided, directed system where you're not just kind of like learning little bits here and there and actually being like, okay, how do I make a power system that isn't going to hurt somebody kind of stuff? And how do I make it efficient and not just like good enough, which I think is a lot of what we tend to learn sort of from online type stuff. Yeah. And I think that is definitely a lot of scope for, I think that online learning platforms could definitely step up. Um, uh, and, you know, there's things like Coursera and Udemy and stuff where you do get, to a certain extent, the sense of community. Um, it's just like, I guess, the the thing with, uh, yeah, yeah, programs is that, like, the buy-in is so much higher that people are, it, it selects for people who are more serious and more dedicated to the thing versus, you know, on Coursera, I've definitely joined a lot of Coursera courses that I've basically spent no time on. <laughs> Same! <laughs> Um, which is, you know, partly why it's so cool that libraries sometimes give us access to these things and stuff. Love yeah. libraries, but more maker libraries, please, for sure. Yeah, and when they like some libraries are starting at three D printers and stuff, love it. So we're coming to the end of our time here, and I would love to hear about what's next for you. What are your big dreams? If you had like infinite resources, for example, uh, and time and the space to dedicate to it. Do you have any big ideas that you would love to bring to life? Honestly, I think the refrigeration systems, there's so much scope. I can totally imagine sinking a 10 years of my life and barely making a dent in what's possible in the refrigeration space. Um, so, yeah, I think that that would be the thing. I am the the big thing in in real life uh, of finite resources is that I'm moving from Jersey City to the Bay Area soon, like you know this year. Um, I was in San Francisco for a couple of weeks for open source, um, and uh, I just fell in love with the community there. Like you know, there's Burning Man, so there's like you know all of these like art projects that are engineering -y as well. Then there's the whole kind of like inventor, innovator, um, change maker paradigm, and just like the whole VC structure is there as well to just promote innovation and change. So yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to becoming a part of that community um, more and uh, uh, 
yeah, doing stuff together. I, definitely, there'll be a lot of refrigeration to come in the near future. But uh, other than that, like, you know, it's really whoever I end up meeting and uh, whatever ideas end up being struck. Yeah, well, I think it's safe to say that San Francisco is exciting to see more of Amitabh as well. Thank you so much for joining me. It is so much of a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, your mind is so full of interesting things. And I know that we only scratched the surface here, but hopefully people will go to your link tree. Uh, follow all the links in the description below. Be sure to keep up with uh, all your future projects and uh, subscribe on whatever media they tend to use. <laughs> I mean, honestly, like reach out if you need help, because I, I during the 100 years of sharing, I tried this thing that was like, um, make stuff today where I just wanted people to reach out to me when they uh, for like, you know, when they were like really motivated to make something and they were uh, kind of like stuck somehow. Uh, I, I love connecting people and uh, I love helping out. So, you know, reach out. Uh, that <laughs> right there, I think, is one of the best things that we have about the open source hardware community. Thank you again. Uh, and can't wait to see what you get up to next. Yeah. Uh, Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> okay. Uh,